The flightless dodo bird, a symbol of human-caused extinction, is facing a chance at revival after more than three centuries of disappearance. The biotechnology company Colossal Biosciences has achieved a major breakthrough by successfully culturing primordial germ cells from the Nicobar pigeon, the dodo's closest relative. This accomplishment paves the way for using gene editing technology and chickens as surrogates to recreate the dodo, simultaneously sparking an intense debate about the ethics and risks of bringing an extinct creature back into the world. What kind of animal would give up flight altogether? To understand that, we turn to a small volcanic island in the Indian Ocean, isolated by coral reefs and cut off from any mainland. Mauritius was an evolutionary workshop, sealed away from the rest of the world. For millions of years, there were no cats, no snakes, and no mammals prowling the undergrowth, only birds, reptiles, and insects sharing the landscape. Into this calm drifted a distant ancestor of modern pigeons, carried perhaps by storms or ocean winds until it touched down on land. Here, flight stopped being a necessity. Food was abundant on the forest floor and without predators, there was no need to flee. Over untold generations, wing strength diminished and sturdy legs took over the work of survival. Those descendants slowly became larger and more specialized. Freed from the cost of flight, they directed their energy toward walking, nesting and foraging. Fossil remains show a bird shaped for powerful ground movement, strong legs, reinforced joints, and dense muscles built for balance and speed in dense terrain. These were not awkward ground dwellers, but confident runners moving fluidly beneath canopies of ebony and tambala cock a trees. Evolution crafted a bird in perfect harmony with its island home, one that thrived by staying on the ground rather than escaping from it. For centuries, people told a different story. Early sailors described ungainly fowls and artists imagined them as round, sluggish creatures barely able to move. But the fossils tell another version entirely. Scans of dodo skeletons reveal muscle attachments and bone structures suited for agility, not clumsiness. The bird's spine was compact but mobile, helping it keep balance while running or turning on rough ground. Even the small wings appear to have been used for steering and stability, not simply hanging uselessly at their sides. Once you look at the bones, the caricature of the hapless dodo falls apart. The living bird was no giant, but a sturdy figure, roughly two to two and a half feet tall. Contemporary accounts suggest a body covered with soft grayish blue feathers that shifted slightly in light Paired with a strong, curved beak capable of cracking fruit and seeds, it was built not for comedy, but for competence. A well-equipped forager, perfectly fitted to the ecological rhythms of an island world. Mauritius rewarded this precision. In the absence of predators, even eggs laid openly on the ground remained safe. The island's forests were filled only with the sounds of wind and surf, not hunters. In that piece, the dodo's instincts changed. Fear faded, replaced by curiosity. The birds grew calm, social, and unhurried, a temperament suited to a land without threats. When new creatures eventually appeared on the shores, the dodo's patience and trust did not seem like mistakes. Until then, they had always been advantages. Flightlessness, in this context, wasn't a failure of evolution. It was a triumph of adaptation. The dodo was the product of remarkable stability, molded by an environment that changed so slowly it rewarded specialization. Scientists now describe them as fast, agile, and exquisitely adjusted to their surroundings for millions of years, a lineage that refined its place with quiet success. Yet island perfection comes with a cost. The same isolation that let the dodo thrive also left it defenseless against rapid change. And change when it came arrived not from natural shifts in wind or sea, but in the shape of sails on the horizon and footsteps on the sand. When European ships first reached Mauritius in 1598, they stepped into an ecosystem untouched by humanity. The Dutch sailors who landed there described birds so unafraid that they would walk directly toward people. In ship journals, dodos are recorded standing placidly as men approached, some even allowing themselves to be caught by hand. 
The island, rich with fruit, fresh water and giant tortoises, seemed an unclaimed paradise along the Indian Ocean routes between Africa and Asia. For the dodos, these new figures moving through the forest were merely another kind of large animal. Centuries of isolation had erased instinctive fear. Curiosity guided their responses. At first, sailors treated the strange birds as curiosities. Their size and tameness made them easy to catch, yet most found the meat too tough and stringy to be worth the effort. Crews soon returned to easier meals, turtles or pigs that had already been left behind by earlier expeditions. That poor reputation for flavor later distorted the story, giving rise to the myth that humans hunted the dodo into extinction. In truth, direct hunting played only a small part. The greatest threat arrived quietly in barrels, cages, and the shadows of ship holds, the unwelcome passengers that came ashore with humans. Rats were among the first to spread across the island. Once established, they multiplied rapidly, scaling trees and foraging across nesting grounds. The dodo's open ground nests had never faced mammalian predators. Eggs that once survived unguarded for weeks began disappearing overnight. Pigs released by settlers rooted through the undergrowth, digging through nests while searching for fallen fruit. Monkeys, most likely crab-eating macaques, raided eggs directly from the forest floor, while goats stripped protective plants that once sheltered nesting areas. Each new species reshaped the environment in small, relentless ways. The dodo's evolutionary success had been built on a stable system, no predators, predictable food, and ample space. That balance collapsed with the arrival of mammalian intruders. Within only a few breeding cycles, the birth rate fell below what was needed to sustain the population. Adults lived on, but fewer young survived to replace them. Fragment by fragment, the population began to thin and parts of the forest fell silent. What evolution had refined over long spans of natural isolation began unraveling within a few human generations. Records from the early 1600s still described dodos as abundant, but only decades later, sightings had become infrequent. Settlers cleared forests for lumber and crops, replacing dense habitat with open land. Fires pressed into valleys that once offered safe nesting sites. By the time the century reached its middle decades, visitors were noting how scarce the birds had become. The last confirmed description dates to 1,662, with some later accounts hinting at possible remnants as late as the early 1,690s. Most researchers now accept the extinction as having occurred by the 1,660s, though the precise year remains uncertain. Regardless of the date, the entire loss unfolded within barely a lifetime of contact. What ended the dodo was not deliberate destruction, but the unplanned chaos of ecological change. The creatures introduced by people, rats, pigs, macaques, and goats unwound a system that had endured for millennia without terrestrial predators. Human settlements simply accelerated the collapse. Within a century, a stable, self-contained island community had been replaced by a mixed ecology of invaders feeding, trampling, and multiplying without limit until the dodo had no space left within it. And yet, even as the living bird faded, its image began to take on a second life. The sailors and settlers who left Mauritius carried home their sketches and tales, passing them along to artists who had never seen the animal in motion. From those fragments, a new version of the dodo began to form, one that would outlive every memory of the real bird. Centuries later, science began to separate legend from anatomy. From myth to science, rebuilding the real dodo begins with asking how a single painting could shape global memory. The familiar image of a round, awkward bird traces back to artists who never saw the real animal alive. Early European painters like Roland Savory worked from decaying stuffed specimens sent from Mauritius. Feathers had fluffed, flesh had collapsed, and bills had stiffened at odd angles, giving rise to a puffed, clumsy profile that matched no living creature. That distorted outline, copied for centuries and even used to guide early skeletal reconstructions, cemented the myth of the dodo as a symbol of extinction and foolishness. When scientists returned to the fossils themselves, a far leaner reality appeared. 
Collections from the Ma Osonga Oil site revealed compact leg bones with distinct ridges showing strong muscle attachments. The ankle joints carry deep tendon scars, evidence of speed and stability used for quick ground movements. Computer models based on these measurements recreated a bird built for balance and endurance, capable of moving fast across uneven forest terrain. The dodo was not a waddler, but an active forager, adapted to sprint and pivot with surprising agility. Neil Gosling and his colleagues at the University of Southampton revisited four centuries of literature to test that idea against all available evidence. Their conclusion overturned what culture had repeated for generations. The dodo had been fast, agile and physically refined for millions of years before its disappearance. The notion of a slow, dim creature had no anatomical support. It survived only because artists, not scientists, became the custodians of its image. By connecting fossil structure to living analogues among ground-dwelling pigeons and rails, researchers showed that flightlessness and athleticism often evolved together. On Mauritius, losing a flight had been a strategic trade, not a mistake. Further insight came from examining the skull. Using scans to create a digital cast of the brain cavity, researchers estimated the dodo's brain to body ratio and found it comparable to that of modern pigeons. In plain terms, the brain was neither unusually large nor small. It was exactly what would be expected from a bird with complex navigation and memory. Pigeons are capable of problem solving and spatial reasoning, which suggests their Mauritian descendants likely shared similar skills. The long-standing stereotype of the stupid dodo collapsed under this evidence. Intelligence had simply been underestimated because the bird's form no longer aligned with human expectations of grace or flight. Much of that misunderstanding came from, from culture rather than data. In Victorian times, Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland turned the dodo into a polite, absurd caricature, an emblem of obsolescence wearing a waistcoat. Combined with Savory's paintings, that portrayal stuck for more than a century, filtering through education, slang and museum displays. Even early 20th century scientific illustrations conformed to the bloated silhouette familiar from art rather than the structure evident in bones. Misinterpretation became tradition and the dodo's true design was obscured. To restore accuracy, modern paleo artists now collaborate closely with biologists and anatomists. Karen Fawcett's sculpted reconstruction relies directly on precise osteological data, muscle mapping and bits of surviving soft tissue. Her model with upright stance and firm balance conveys strength rather than bulk. Julian Hume's illustrations echo this approach, showing a slender, mobile bird shaped for life on the forest floor. Together, these scientifically grounded reconstructions do more than depict. They serve as research tools that allow scientists to test posture, gait, and likely feeding behavior. Through the fusion of fossil analysis, digital modeling, and art, the dodo has been rebuilt piece by piece, not as a failure of evolution, but as evidence of how precisely life adapts to isolation. The story has shifted from mockery to understanding. The dodo was a specialist, not a misfit, and its disappearance speaks more to the fragility of ecosystems than to any flaw in design. In redefining the bird, science has reopened a larger question that moves beyond memory or myth. If we can reconstruct the dodo's body and genome so completely, what might that knowledge make possible next? Now, attention has turned towards something even more ambitious, the potential return of the island bird itself. Colossal Biosciences, a genetics company known for high profile de-extinction projects, is attempting to recreate a living counterpart to the dodo using modern gene editing tools. The scientists involved have compared DNA fragments recovered from, an from ancient bones with genetic material from the Nicobar pigeon, the dodo's closest living relative. By identifying key genetic differences linked to the dodo's distinct beak, body size, and feathering, they believe they can guide living cells to express those same traits. The goal is not to clone the extinct bird outright, but to build an organism that functions ecologically and physically much like it once did. 
The foundation of their approach lies in culturing primordial germ cells, PGCs, the cells that form eggs and sperm in birds. These cells carry the blueprint for future generations. Until recently, maintaining avian PGCs in laboratory conditions was considered nearly impossible. But Colossal's team has successfully developed a culture system for the Nicobar pigeon, opening the door to targeted genetic editing. Once the modified PGCs are introduced into embryos of a surrogate bird species, most likely chickens, they can give rise to offspring carrying specific traits selected from the reconstructed dodo genome. Because birds develop within eggs, each cycle requires considerable time, one generation to produce germline carriers and another to reveal the full set of edited traits. Even with that constraint, Colossal's CEO, Ben Lam, estimates that a first generation of dodo-like birds could appear within five to seven years. The company's ambition extends beyond a few symbolic specimens. Lam has stated that their long-term objective is to produce thousands of birds, enough to form a stable, genetically diverse population that could one day return to Mauritius. The scale of the plan divides opinion. Supporters call it a milestone in avian research, while critics describe it as a blend of technical optimism and misplaced nostalgia. Detractors argue that these would not be true dodos, but hybrids or reconstructions lacking the full environmental context of their ancestors. Some worry that the energy and funding directed towards such projects could draw attention away from living species already on the brink. Philosopher Heather Browning cautions that genetic editing and artificial breeding can expose animals to serious welfare issues, including malformed embryos and early mortality. These concerns raise an uncomfortable question about the ethical boundaries of creation, whether reviving a lost form of life can ever justify the risks involved. Supporters of the project see it differently. Beth Shapiro, Colossal's chief science officer and a leading paleogeneticist, argues that the work provides vital infrastructure for avian conservation. Culturing and storing PGCs establishes a foundation for biobanking, a method of preserving genetic diversity that could help rescue species suffering from inbreeding or habitat constraints. Evolutionary geneticist Koch van Oosterhout notes that techniques emerging from the dodo project could strengthen populations of endangered birds, notably the Mauritian pink pigeon, which still struggles with limited genetic variation. By restoring lost diversity through controlled breeding, scientists might provide those species with the adaptive flexibility to withstand changing climates and disease pressures. In this view, the dodo's revival is less about spectacle and more about developing the tools to safeguard the living. Even scientists skeptical of full de-extinction acknowledge that the work reshapes what conservation genetics can achieve. Whether the final bird is labeled a replica, a proxy, or a hybrid may matter less than the technology it inspires. Avian germ cell culture, once an obscure experimental technique, now bridges the gap between evolutionary biology and hands-on restoration. It introduces a new kind of responsibility, the ability to decide deliberately which traits of an extinct species might re-enter the world. As the project progresses, the debate remains as much philosophical as scientific, the extinction sits at the intersection of invention and memory, challenging assumptions about what it means to repair the natural world. Its implications stretch beyond one bird and one island, touching on how humans measure progress against past loss. The next question is whether reclaiming what was once gone will teach us restraint or encourage us to test those limits again. The dodo story is a testament to how isolation creates unique but incredibly fragile life. Islands account for roughly 75% of recorded bird extinctions. Currently, scientists are using genetic research to revive the dodo, aiming to strengthen surviving species and promote conservation. The dodo's legacy serves as a reminder that survival depends on foresight from the start, not resurrection at the end.